Gina, great to meet you. And it looks like you're uh, you're in your elements. You're in your work space. <laughs> I'm in my little three by three booth. Yeah, thanks for having me. This is great, uh, Gina, a voice actor. Uh, so you have been remote for forever then, right? <laughs> yeah, I've never been into a studio in a major city to do any of the projects that I voiced. Last year, I voiced over 250 projects and every one of them was right from home with my dogs in the booth and nice. wearing my pajamas. <laughs> yeah. I, I know you got your start in radio and yeah. that that obviously leads to this work for a lot of people. But did you was there a particular time you kind of knew, all right, voice acting is where I want to go? No, you know, you're right. I did start in radio in the late 90s and I did that for almost 10 years. And then I moved on to entertainment reporting and podcast hosting like you and did that for a while. And I started voiceover as just a little side hustle in 2014. I just sort wow. of missed radio and thought, you know, here's a nice way to stay connected and just try to do some projects online. Um, but in 2020, when the pandemic hit, I had opened my own business in January. And of course, <laughs> it shut down in March. And then I was really trying to figure out what I was going to do. I didn't even know if I could pay my rent. My wow. sister had taken a voiceover class in the city over Zoom and said, I think you should really just try to take it professional, full time. I mean, what else are you going to do right now? And so it almost came out of like necessity. I was not expecting to make it my full-time career. And it's been three years almost now. And I, that and honestly ended up being the best decision I ever made. So at, at this point now, do you have more people requesting you than, than you knocking on? Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. Yeah. In the beginning, I was chasing so many opportunities and I was relying really heavily on casting sites. And then as I started to get agents and book more work and start direct marketing, uh, this year, I would say about 35 to 40% of the projects that I booked just came direct into my inbox, which is really different than three years ago, which is probably no percent, maybe 5%, very little. Um, so I'm constantly networking, marketing, building connections with people so that I have opportunities coming to me as well as building up my website, my SEO mm -hmm. and things like yeah. that. Yeah, I, I notice uh, well, as we all are now. I mean, you're you're everywhere. Uh, YouTube, TikTok. <laughs> yeah, you got to be. Yeah, I, I, mean, I, I was I was like really. I'm like, do I need to be on TikTok? Like, I'm too old for TikTok, but yeah. it actually ended up being pretty fun. And I like having that presence just to make connections with people. It doesn't necessarily bring me work, but it's just it's definitely nice to be connected with other voice actors since we all are kind of lone wolves. Like, we get to see each other's work and get to know each True. other. But yeah, you know, you got to be everywhere all the time and you want to try to stay top of mind because it's a super competitive industry. It's very easy to kind of get left behind or sort of be replaced by the next cool voice a casting director comes across. Yeah, I've really embraced it. I, I you and I are probably close in age. I, I love I'm on Twitch, YouTube. Yeah. TikTok. Oh, well, I, I love Twitch because I love video games so much. Yeah. So I play a lot of competitive games and you know, I don't, people wouldn't expect, you know, someone in their forties, female yeah. mom, you know, out her playing call of duty or league of legends, Valorant, Fortnite, you know, all these games, sure. Elden ring, but I love it. So I don't know. It, I feel like it kind of keeps me young to be on TikTok and to be playing these, you know, games and, and then voicing them as well, which is so fun. Yeah. I play, uh, the sports games. I mean, I, the community oh, yeah. is, in, I, I cannot believe the community on Twitch. You know, I've, I've tried to tell people who are not into it, Mm -hmm. uh, the market for that. I mean, I, I feel like there's a, there's a lot of money there too. I mean, mm -hmm. you could go on, on, on that server at three in the morning and there's 200,000 people playing video games. Oh yeah. There's always people on, which I think is great. And the nice yeah. thing or the interesting thing I think about Twitch is like a lot of times the chat is reflective of the streamer themselves. So if they tend sure. to be a pretty positive person, then their chat sort of reflects that. If they're sort of toxic alpha, you know, giving people a hard time, you can see like the chat gives them a hard time too. So they have a lot of influence over, you know, over just the, you know, the general vibe of the chat. But yeah, you can always find somebody on that's for sure. Yeah. I, I liked what you said about on TikTok, other voice actors and then people i know that people show what they do the day in the life of a voice actor or day in the yeah. life yeah yeah we'll do voice actor challenges or yeah. we'll show what it's like to be in the booth we'll sometimes we'll show the audition and then the final product uh we'll talk about you know just general tips and tricks because you know i think when you're on the outside looking in you're sort of wondering how how do you even do this the thing is though and maybe you've seen this across other industries as well it's like everybody has an opinion and what i say about voiceover is like there's too much information and yet not enough information and it can be hard when you're trying to get into it to even know 
is this even the right opinion? Is this correct or factual? You know, and so that can be very hard to determine when you're trying to get into the industry as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I think about the business I'm in play by play and doing a lot of it's a lot of fly by the seat of your pants, which is yeah. I like. But yeah. when you get a script, uh, you know, and I've, I've I've been reading scripts now where you have no idea maybe how to play it. I mean, even as a voice actor, right? Yeah. You yeah. Have to, you have to play it a certain way. I mean, sometimes they give you some pretty clear instructions. Sometimes sure. they give really vague, confusing instructions. And sometimes they give no instructions. So, you know, we don't have a lot of time to assess scripts necessarily just because the industry moves so fast. So that's one of the skills that you kind of learn when you're getting into voiceover is, you know, getting a script, reading through it quickly and saying, okay, I think I understand what the tone or the vibe should be here. And also really embracing your own personality, voice and perspective on it. Because I think a lot of times when people first start, they try to be what they think the casting director or the agent wants, what they think the brand wants. And it's really more about your own take on it a lot of times, you know, and just bringing yeah. that personality to the table. Because voiceover is very much about authenticity. Yeah, you have some big clients. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at your list of Vistaprint, Burger King, Xfinity. I know I've heard you before, <laughs> that voice, yeah. Yeah, I was the voice of Xfinity Rewards for a year and a half. My contract <laughs> just ran out not that long ago. I had such a great time. And the funny thing about it was I thought I had just booked one commercial with them and that was it. And I was yeah. just happy to get the one. And that turned into seven national commercials and being the voice of the brand for that year and a half, which was amazing. I mean, it's like you really don't know what's even going to come from just you know, one audition or one booking, it can lead to so many other things. And yeah, I've been really lucky to work with so many big brands and, you know, be on TV and national radio and online yeah. ads. And I just, I love it. I love what I do. So can you be in a room and not hear the TV, but when your voice comes on, you can hear it? Uh, yeah, but I, I'm always looking for commercials. Like I'm the weirdo in the car yeah. no. the station because I want to hear it and I hear my friends. Sometimes I hear myself. And it's funny because I was shopping in a store last year and I did a commercial for NJM Insurance and I heard it and I was like, oh, it's me. You know, like I wanted to yeah. say like, it's me, you know, and everyone's just walking by in the store and I wanted to be like, look, I play the wife in this commercial. But yeah, it's always it's still funny to hear myself sometimes. But yeah. I'm always like actively looking for and watching commercials. It's like homework for me to see what's going on. Yeah. And for those watching, you're just reading lines. You don't hear the, the finished product. You, oh, yeah. You, no, I have no idea what it's a lot of times. I have no idea what it sounds like. like OK, one so thing, you don't get anything. You hear it for the first time. On, OK. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even know. You know, something that was really interesting to a lot of people was last year I was in the Walking Dead video game, The Walking Dead mm -hmm. Last Mile. I only recorded my lines. So I didn't know, and I only got my scenes. So I had no idea what was going on. I mean, I just took the director's word for it, obviously. But then when the scenes came out, I was like, oh, like <laughs> I didn't know what anybody else sounded like or what the, I didn't know what the scenes, the cut scenes were going to look like. I didn't know what the other stories that were happening with other characters. It was so I was watching it like a viewer. I was like, this is so interesting to see what yeah. was really going on. But yeah, a lot of times I don't very rarely I'll see something, you know, during the session, they might show it on the screen. Here's a rough draft of what we think it's going to be, but I really never see the final product before it's live on air and everybody else sees it. Yeah. That, that video game market is, it's amazing because I mean, we see commercials for games. Yeah. Uh, I know with, I have a friend who works for uh, San Diego studios, which makes the baseball game. I mean, that's a, a giant studio with tons of employees and that they, they work on just one game. I mean, yeah. so for your business, it's, I mean, they got major actors doing voices now. I mean, Oh yeah. And video games. I yeah. mean, there's a lot of opportunity just because of so many indie developers and, you know, you have triple A games, but then there's like double A. And so there's all these different people. And then yeah. I think during the pandemic, you know, there was this increase because obviously people were home, people then now want to be home. Um, and, you know, so there's been like a renewed interest in video games or a growing interest even more so. So um, I feel like there's been a lot more opportunity. I've voiced more than a dozen games over the past year and I have some new ones coming out this year and it's nice. definitely my favorite genre of voice i mean you know commercial typically pays the most in voiceover but i'm like i i'll take video games like every day of the week i get excited every time it's so fun now in commercials there's like is there commission later depending on how yeah so the, the difference yeah. with commercial is 
usually they're going to pay for the run, you know, so however yeah. long they want to run the commercial for a year, they're licensing your voice for that. Some companies or brands want exclusivity for that year. So, you know, somebody like Xfinity might say, I want a year's exclusivity for telecommunications, no competitors, no anybody else. When that year is up, then they can renew the commercial. So a good example from my career would be Invesco. At the end of a year with Invesco, they renewed it with me and I they paid again for another year, which was great. Um, but so that's really how commercial works. Everything else is typically like you're you're paid for, you know, the project itself. It might be the length, the time, whatever, or how it's being used. And then that's it. So we don't really see as much uh, royalties necessarily. Um, that does change a bit if you get into like animation and you're on TV shows and things like that. I was going to ask you about that. So how do, how do you get into that? So when it comes to animation, which is when people come to me for coaching, that's like a lot of times people are talking about video games, anime, animation. When it comes to animation, that usually would come from having agents and a manager yeah. and things like that. And there's a lot of different ways that you can get an agent or manager. You can do workshops with them. A lot of them make themselves accessible. So they'll do wor Zoom workshops where you can read for them and get feedback and kind of get on their radar and even get a sense of, you know, if they're feeling you and you're liking them. So that's kind of nice. You, a lot of them have um, submission instructions on their websites and things like that. So uh, that will really be helpful if someone's interested in animation. That's kind of where you want to head and you want to start with, you know, coaching and training and just understanding, you know, how that genre even works. Because what happens even with video games is people will come to me and say, I think it'd be so cool to be in video games, but they, they don't really know like the the genres, like they're not playing games actively now. So then I have to start, sort of break it down for them. Like, you know, this is what, this is what Borderlands is and this is what Dark yeah. Souls is. And this, and they're like, oh, you know? So I do think it's helpful to know the genre, even if you don't play it, but to know it, you know, to watch it and, you know, watch videos online, watch Twitch, watch YouTube and things like that. Yeah, it seems like the video games are almost like mini movies, though. So the, the strategy <laughs> yeah. from the voice actor would be kind of you're you're doing it like an acting job, right? As well, because oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I mean the thing is about I've seen it with video games and with animation. Like you know, I think about like Arcane, which is the TV show based on League of Legends that was incredible and came out last year, or the show Invincible through Amazon. Like you have these people in these extraordinary circumstances where it's like the world of League of Legends or the world of superheroes. But what's really going on in the scenes are like very like real human things that we can all relate to. So it's not really so much about like doing voices, which I think a lot of people think about when they think about animation and video games. It's like about being a great actor and bringing yeah. truth to everything that you're doing. So it's way more important to spend the time in like acting classes or studying acting than trying to like, I don't know, like people come to me and they're like, oh, I could do like a witch impression or like a witch voice. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with that. Like, you know, because know it's mean. so much more about your acting. And so, um, and you see that with video games, they become way more cinematic. And, and it, I mean, it's just incredible if you think about games like God of War or The Last of Us and things like that and what's happening. Yeah, in well, those it's going to be a, show, a movie, right? Or yeah, TV? and they're turning yeah. it into a show on HBO, oh, yeah. right? Because yeah. it's just, it's an incredible story. And I would say to people that are getting into video games, I said, if I took this scene from The Last of Us and I showed it to my mom, who's almost 70 and obviously doesn't play games, and I said, what is this from? She would think maybe a TV show, which would make sense that it ended up on HBO, or a movie and not a video game. Like, it's changed yeah. so much over time from when we were playing as kids, you know, <laughs> we were playing like Sega and NES to like what yep. it is today. It's 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 crazy and it's interesting and I, I just love it. Yeah, I just got that, uh, by the way, Last of Us. Oh on, yeah. Um, yeah, on PlayStation, so I got to Do do you think there was a shift in video games for that reason? I mean, it, I think the demographic because at some point I, the video game companies must have been like we can't appeal to, you know, for 15-year-olds. We our age, the games have to be Yeah, we grew up we playing have the games. money. Yeah. It's like we grew up playing the games and who's making these games? People our age that grew up loving video games and are trying to push the envelope and it's like we still want to keep playing. So they're sure. making games that are keeping the interest of adults, which is amazing. And they're more challenging. You know, they're more emotional. They're more investing. You know, there's just so many amazing things about it. Um, yeah. I remember like thinking that I was, I'm like, I, I'm so good at video games. Like when I was like, you know, maybe in my thirties, I'm like, I'm so good at video games. Cause you know, when I was younger, like I was amazing at Tetris or something. And then I started playing call of duty and I was like, Oh my God, I'm terrible. Like, wait a minute. I don't know. I can't even aim. I'm like spinning around and firing in the yeah. air. Like so embarrassing. Um, and I've just gotten into all these, you know, games that really appeal, you know, to teens, 20 somethings and adults. Yeah. And it's just incredible how the industry has moved forward. It just keeps 
getting more innovative, more interesting. And gosh, I just, I'm like so fascinated by it. It's like all I'm, I'm always thinking about, like, how can I get into these games <laughs> that oh, I yeah. love so much? <laughs> I, I mean, I used to think about when I was 15, that's when Nintendo came out. I did think like, what in the world is going to happen in 40 I years have imagined I yeah couldn't... and now i think what's gonna what's gonna be like in 40 years from now i mean oh yeah i mean i guess more vr and things like yeah. that but, you know, i remember like mm, i don't know what it was was it maybe like the sega dreamcast or something yeah. like and it was like a cd right and there was yep. like a game about like i don't know it was like a home intruder or something but it looked real like it was filmed like with a camera and on set and i remember seeing it in my friend's house being like what is this like because i was playing like metroid and super mario and all this stuff and like yeah you know, and I was like, what is this? Like, I just, I, and it just kept growing and growing from there. I think it, it'll probably lean more into VR, which is still honestly like really in the early stages. I've done some VR games. I have definitely one coming out this year that I know of that I'm excited about called Survival Nation. Nice. And I play like, the head of the survival camp. It's so funny because I keep getting cast in these like, you know, like tough female roles. Yeah. But, like, I'm literally afraid of everything in life like it's not like me at all I think it's just my voice it's that low husky voice I guess yeah. in the acting um but yeah yeah I think we'll see more you know VR as time goes on because they're still really trying to develop it and make it you know appeal to more people it's still sort of niche I think with people yeah yeah I, I look forward to that I've always um I, I've had an, those voice guys at, at a radio station have you ever been asked to do that to be like the voice of a station or I, oh yeah yeah radio like that's so that's radio promo or radio imaging yeah and imaging, i yeah. just started doing uh yes i was the voice of a station up in um buffalo new york in that area yeah and, um, I saw that. yeah yeah so so with a country station up there and that's from a former co-worker of mine we worked at kc 101 in connecticut and then he ended up being a program director up in buffalo nice. and he just reached out to me last year and i was like of course like i just you know i credit so much of my career to radio even though it, I had to shed a lot of the radio in me when I came to voiceover because it's like it's a little bit announcery. And when you're on the radio, you're often like I feel like I'm talking to the whole state of Connecticut or whatever or New York. I was in New York for a while as well. And in voiceover, it's very one on one. But I did learn a lot of great things through voice uh, through radio. I learned a lot about audio production, obviously, and yeah. about thinking quick on my feet and, you know, just kind of talking off the cuff, especially doing morning radio. So uh, yeah, radio imaging is definitely more on my priority list this year after getting into it a little bit last year. And I felt it's so nice. It's like coming back to something after 25 years of, you know, starting in radio. Yeah, those those uh, men and women who do those like, you know, <laughs> today's best hits. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm very yeah. into like radio imaging. And then my other goal this year is TV promo. So like when you're watching TV and you're watching maybe Food Network and there's commercials that come on four things on Food Network or on the Disney Channel. So I'm very into TV promo. I did a lot of coaching this year and just came out with my demo. So that's sort yeah. of like the next genre I'm chasing because a lot of these other things I'm feeling like okay, like I feel comfortable and I feel like I'm getting those great opportunities. So every year I'm like setting my new goals and being like, all right, what are we, what are we chasing this year to add into the mix? You know? Yeah. Uh, for the younger people that are watching this or in that you'll coach, uh, you probably started in production, audio production, the way I did using a reel to reel, right? In carts. And, yeah. When I started, yeah. it was reel to reel. And one time in razor radio, blades and yeah. 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 And when I was an intern, I put the reel, you'll appreciate this. Like, I mean, I feel like some young people, maybe Gen Z or Z younger, like what is a reel to reel? But anyway, you'll, you'll appreciate it. So I, I was putting the reel on and that's when I first started, there were still reels and there were still eight tracks. I put yeah. it on backwards. No, it shot off across the room and my boss was like, and now you will re spool it. So the whole day I was sitting there. I mean, the reel was like bigger than my head and yeah. I was just spooling it like this is awful. But when I came into radio, it was just starting to transition over to CDs and every song was an individual CD. So I just had like a pile, you know, in awful. front of me all the time. And yeah. uh, I mean, it's crazy how much things have advanced by the time I left. Obviously, everything was digitized. But that was just over like an eight year period. It had changed incredibly fast. I would never want to go back to that. I mean, no, I let's love... not go back to reel to reels. No, I mean, I use uh, Audacity and and yeah, Adobe. You know, the free stuff. I mean, it's so easy now. The things that you can do. But yeah, um, I always wondered why they call them carts. That's a radio term, by the way, for people. Yeah, our radio dorky radio talk. They're, they're eight tracks, but in their business, they, they, call, them they call them carts. They did. They did. And you know, everything, you know, everything was manual. So yeah. 
when I started interning uh, for my boss at the time, um, he, you know, like a song would come on and he'd be like, all right, I've got three minutes to run to the bathroom and grab a drink. Like yeah. you're in charge. And I would just start sweating. I was like, oh my gosh, like, wait a minute. And I'm like, trying to have the A track ready. And it was so, it was so stressful, but I did learn a lot about radio production obviously you know yeah. i started before i use adobe audition to this day and when i when i was in radio it was called cool edit and yeah. and so you know i've just never strayed from the path i've used adobe for 25 years or whatever and um but it's really helped me i mean being fast and being comfortable and efficient with audio editing is a big piece of you know being successful and, and letting you hustle and voiceover you know you don't yeah. want to get you caught up in like sort of that technical back end of things and really now because of the pandemic and everything being remote like you got to be an audio, a little audio engineer, like, and a voice actor and the marketer. You're like everything, you know? Yeah. I, I tell people I have a pretty easy setup here. It sounds fine. You obviously you're, you know what you have, but I, I try to stray people away from doing it cheap. If you want to do a podcast yeah. Uh, for me, I still am kind of a pain in the neck with audio stuff. If somebody, <laughs> even a friend, I'm honest with them. I'll be yeah. like, I can't like that. No, yeah. Sound. So yeah, no, exactly. Same please, with like yeah. USB microphones. Like a lot of people, you know, it just doesn't work. It's not the same quality no. as an XLR microphone, which plugs yes. into a little audio interface. And I tell people like, you know, maybe you can get going for like, you know, six or $700. I know maybe that feels like a lot, but it's worth it to just do it the is. coaching and feel ready and then have the right equipment. Because one of the first things that clients listen for is audio quality. And it's like, you don't want them to count. You might be the best actor ever, but if your audio quality is bad, it's like, I can't even get past like the buzzing or the white noise or the, you know, the sound of, you know, certain microphones. Like I can't even get through that to listen to your read. So it, I just can't, you know, I can't have that kind of quality. So I think that's a really important thing that people should try to focus on. Even on my site, I made a page called voiceover equipment, just in case people are ever wondering, like, yeah. what? because I, I get that question all the time. Yeah. Well, what should I get? You know? So I was like, let me just make a whole page that tells people, you know, what might be helpful. I do too, for people in the, in the broadcasting world. And I, I go to guitar center and I, I tell people, if you need help, go there. Uh, they, 100%. Guitar they center, b &H photo. Yeah. Yeah, I love them. Yeah, it's the yeah. same. And uh, I buy all of my equipment through Sweetwater. Uh, what I like yeah, about them, I use you them know, too. Yep. yeah, they're great. I mean, yep. you know, the difference between them or somebody like Amazon, which of course they have everything, is at Sweetwater you have these people that are like they really know audio and they yeah. can really answer your questions. And uh, another nice thing is that when you buy something, you can split it into six payments. You yes. do like, and it's not credit; it's just split it. And I tell everyone, I don't care what's going on; I could be so successful. I'll split it into six payments every time. I'm like, let me just let that kind of, you know, let me reap what I, you know, what I put out there. Let me try to earn back what I just spent. So, I mean, Sweetwater's been so great to me, and I really, I mean, that's that's always where I'm shopping and letting other people, you know, do the same and refer yeah. them. Do you do any voice work for them? That'd be neat. If you... No, I, I'm like, listen, can I be your spokesperson? Yeah. Can I be your spokesperson? Yeah, why not? <laughs> yeah, they're so great, though. I mean, they've really helped me out and and even helped me put together packages that, you know, are really affordable for my young students, especially like my kids, my teens, because it's, you know, it's a lot to ask parents when a kid's like, I want to get into voiceover. It's like, OK, well, it's not going to be it's not the cheapest activity. It's not the yeah. most expensive, but, you know, you got to put in the time for the coaching and the equipment. So they've been super helpful with that as well, which has been super nice. Yeah, I, I want to go back to um, you talked about taking an acting class. Mm -hmm. So. I I was able to be a background actor first time ever on a movie. I love this. And, and after the first time on it, I yeah. you know, I was not I was naive. I don't mind saying this. Yeah. You you really think, oh, I just I'm just gonna be in the background. You actually have to act. Yeah. And I was and like sometimes like ad lib or like, you know, yeah. pantomime, like you're doing this or that. You got to make it look like you're really. Yeah. yeah. You're like, I'll just stand there and look good. And then you're like, oh, my gosh, wait, I need to. Yes. like stuff. Yeah. So after the first time I said, I'm taking a class and I took a class in Boston with a um, Bates Wilder, who's an actor, was terrific. Completely. It's uncomfortable, which was great. You know, <laughs> yeah, teaching how is. to act without talking, really. Mm -hmm. But it changed my whole like I told him. To his class helped me as a background actor. So for those yeah. that are wondering, I encourage you because mm -hmm. you have no idea like in acting, this is another whole thing, how hard that process is to be good at. It is hard. And so in, in voiceover, we, you know, focus on acting classes where sort of you're looking at the script or the copy and 
you know, trying to bring yourself to the table and, you know, make yeah. great acting choices. But it's also super helpful to take improv classes, which I would imagine would be helpful for something like background acting too. It's like, cause you need to, you know, you need to think on your feet. Like they're not going to tell every background actor, like, okay, you do this and you do this. And then yeah. like, you're like this. It's like, you just got to be able to do it. And in, in voiceover, I just got an audition the other day where there were some written lines and then they were like, and then improv. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I still get stressed to this day about it. I kind of like it, but it makes me nervous sometimes, especially if it's live in a session. They're like, okay, like just do something different or just, you know, why don't you just say some wild lines? And I'm like, oh my gosh, I was not prepared for this. So improv is a really, really helpful skill to have. A lot of times casting directors or agents will ask if you have that background and even just taking a class in it can actually do a lot for you. It'll help you be really creative, think on your feet, you yeah. know, be unique and stand out in auditions and things like that. So yeah, for yeah. sure, acting and improv, very important. Yeah. I, people watching, I, I encourage you. I know it's, you know, it's an investment, but you'll feel like a fish out of water if you're going to be on an acting set or you're doing a voiceover yep. and you don't have that experience. Like I can't say how valuable it is. I can't speak enough about. Oh you know. yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because they will really throw things at you out of the blue. Like for example, I might be in a session with, you know, say Burger King and we're doing it a certain way over and over. I've probably done it 20 times, 30 times at this point. And then out of the blue, they'll just like, okay, now just read it a different way. And you're like, yeah. like, I don't know, we've been doing it this way, you know? So just being sort of flexible and and like, yeah, creative and in the moment, it, it really, really helps um, for sure. So you can find some really great voiceover classes if people are interested. In New York, I love Abacus Entertainment and um, Actors Connection. In LA, I take classes at Real Voice LA. In Texas, the Help Network, and and there's so many others, but those are just ones that I have taken classes at and have gotten so much out of. I've met amazing casting directors and agents, and you know, so many great people in the industry. So those are just some places you could look to start. You know, you can find intro courses, intermediate and advanced. Um, yeah, and and even if you're new and you're just getting started, it might feel like you know intimidating or overwhelming, but you know, people in the classes are really welcoming. I think they're happy that you're there. They want yeah. you to succeed. So, you know, putting yourself out there can really take you a long way. Yeah. You know, it's crazy. Um, the class that I took, we, all of us became, we were, we really bonded. It was really our uh, yeah. instructor said he had never seen a class where we all really liked each other and we're all yeah. still friends. Like we're all in a group text still. I love that. So, so you, you, you know, if anything, like I mean, I got more than that out of it, but getting that out of it was just as special because. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. And I will say like the thing about the voiceover community, which I have just loved is how so many of them are so positive and so supportive and, you know, we're each other's competition every day, but it's sure. just, there's so much work out there that it's like, it's hard to, yeah. I mean, I don't really take it personally, but I've met like so many of my best friends at conventions through zoom workshops, classes. In fact, I've only met, like, I'm just thinking now, I mean, I've, I know hundreds of voice actors and I've only met like three in person. Yeah. Everybody else is just, we've met online and this is how we connect and stay in touch. So you're right. I mean, that's just another benefit of taking the classes, meeting other people that are doing what you're doing and they're on the journey. Yeah. It's, like, it's so fun to watch everybody else too, you know? I think so. Yeah. It's so great. It's hard when you're in, in our kind of business because like, it's hard to talk to someone who's not to relate to you because <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the problems we might have are trivial to other people. You know? <laughs> yeah. My problem is like, you know, I was, it was very slow after the holidays and I'm like, Ugh, like nobody's booking me and it's stressing me out. And of course now it's totally fine. But yeah, yeah I guess the things that we stress about or are going through. It's hard for people to understand if they're not, you know, really in it or, I don't know. They just have a different perception. Like someone told me in a coaching once uh, that I was sounding like Siri or Alexa, which is mm. horrible because oh, I'm really? trying to sound yeah. like a human being. Gotcha. I told my friend outside of voiceover and they were like, oh my God, that's so cool. And I was like, it's terrible. I was like, that means I'm not bringing my personality. So it just sounds like a computer, you know, yeah. robot voice. And it was just so funny to talk to her about it because I was complaining and she her she had the complete opposite reaction. Because like, they're oh, famous to them. Yeah, she's like, yeah. Siri, Alexa. And I was like, oh my gosh, like that's, you know, a lot of times in voiceover, it's like, no, I'm looking for a real person. I want it to sound real, believable, authentic, yeah. conversational, natural. So it's definitely not an AI voice. So I remember I, be, I was so upset and I, <laughs> like, I felt like nobody understood, but that's funny. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll wrap it up with so when you're working with Burger King and that 
when do you send it to the agency? Are they the one for Burger King that handles? Yeah, I mean, it depends on like how, you know, how the project is going to go. So sometimes I will record with people online or using a program called Source Connect where my audio goes right down oh, the line yeah. to nice. them in the studio. And so then they just have the audio. Sometimes we'll meet over Zoom like you and I are and I'll record on my end and they'll give me feedback and I'll send it to them directly. Sometimes they'll give me a link like to Dropbox or something like that and I'll upload the file like Every job, every project, every minute of every day is different. But that is yeah. what I love about the industry is like, I do love the unpredictability, which is funny because in life, I want to know everything that's going to happen. I'm like very controlling, but in voiceover, I don't know. There's something about it. I'm just confident and comfortable and, and laid back with sort of the unpredictability. Th this was great, Gina. Great to meet you and, and yeah. uh, nice to form a connection. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah.